Okay, great. So for, uh, thank you very much, and thanks, uh, Yelena and all the gang who've uh, got us here today. Um, as uh, Maria has suggested, the workup for renal transplantation is quite a considerable bit of work. Uh, there's the medical side, the surgical side, the psychosocial side. I think they fall into those three major categories. And uh, I'm just going to tip to through a few of those with you, the sorts of things that go through my mind when I'm seeing the patient in the uh, transplant workup clinic. Uh, overall, this is what we do in the UK. If you're unfortunate enough to have end-stage renal failure as a child, uh, we like PD, yay! Uh, about 40, 45% of children will start life with PD. Um, in the UK, overall, about 20, 22% will get a preemptive transplantation and avoid dialysis. And around 30% um, will have some form of hemodialysis. Um, that's the UK as a whole. In London, we have a slightly different view on things. As Maria has suggested, in a good year, we'll try and transplant perhaps 50% of people before they need dialysis. Uh, and if you're on the hemo program, then Nikos or I may well see you and talk you into a fistula, but we can talk about that at another time. Um, dialysis versus transplantation, essentially there's no great discussion here for the reasons that are alluded to on the right-hand side there. Transplantation is a winner, hands down. Plus, something that's not spoken about greatly in my view. Um, having dialysis is quite a complicated business and you accumulate quite a lot of morbidity associated with it. So dialysis for the vast, vast majority of children is temporary. We're seeing it as a bridge to your transplant, but realistically, transplantation in childhood is also temporary. Most children will go through the revolving door of dialysis, transplantation, and then perhaps dialysis again during their childhood or as they transition into their adolescence. So take a long-term view, ladies and gentlemen, when you see these people. So when should we be transplanting them? The simple answer is on the left-hand side of the screen there, as soon as damn possible. But there are a few things which are just worth considering when you're sitting with the child and their parents in the clinic. And I'm going to talk through some of these in a, in a little bit more detail, and I'd welcome your feedback as well. So why try to get to preemptive transplantation, as um, Maria has suggested? Well, we know that dialysis is quite tricky, and the smaller you are, and particularly if you're having it via central venous catheters, there's a significant morbidity associated with it. Ah, so here's a slide, which I'm not quite sure whether I should be showing you or not. So if you actually end up on dialysis, does that affect your graft function? We know from the adult data, it certainly affects your life expectancy and it probably affects your graft outcome. The ladies and gentlemen in the US say yes, if you have some form of dialysis, it will affect your graph outcome. When I made this point last year, my friend and colleague, Steve, uh, suggested that the UK data didn't support that. So what do we say about that? I don't know. The US data is registry data. Not everybody has to give it, it's voluntary. The UK data is based on uh, data which everyone has to give back. So, make your choice. I always like to look at what's the cause of their end-stage renal failure. And uh, the, uh, the real significance of this is that you know, over 40% of children will have some anatomical abnormality of their lower urinary system. And hence, you need to see a gentleman like the man sitting in front of me, um, John, who has experience in urology to help you work with these children to improve their outcomes after surgery. I'm not going to say anything more about that. 
Um, but in addition is Jo Clothier here. She's a uh, pediatric nephrologist who also is a bladder specialist. And I went to one of her talks the other day and uh, she has a professional interest in children peeing and pooing. And uh, she will tell you if you bother to ask them or even observe them, 80% of children have some abnormality of their passage of urine. Uh, and so there's much more going on there than we realize. Essentially, if you've got bad kidneys, you've got a dodgy bladder. We chaps worry about this sort of thing from time to time, but in the world of transplantation, does it matter? If you look at this, uh, um, the, <laughs> the large fist on the right hand side, does it matter the size of the gentleman or lady giving the kidney? Well, if they're carrying an excess amount of weight, we know that's affecting their kidney function, whatever the GFR is, and is significant for them when they've donated, if they go on to be live donors, they may reach a threshold weight in, in order to donate the kidney, but lo and behold, within a couple of months, they're going to bounce back and then exceed their baseline uh, weight afterwards, and that has a long-term significance for them. From the child's point of view, how small is too small, and we don't really know that, but we would say about 10 kilos is about the right size um, to be considered for transplantation. Uh, we know, and this is UK data, that the smaller, younger child, again, does distinguish themselves in terms of survival uh, compared to other age groups uh, if you have end-stage renal failure. And I think this is due to the complexity of the diseases that they have, plus the difficulty of maintaining them well through a dialysis program. So we say, can we get you to about 10 kilos um, before we'll consider you for transplantation? And uh, in the sort of London world of pediatric transplantation, we tend to like to do intra-abdominal transplants for this size age group. Um, I don't know what the other surgery people in the room think about that. We have a friend and a colleague who works in Glasgow, Vlad, who was here the other year who said, no, not necessary, everything can be done retroperitoneally if you want. And you may think with a child with a lot of omas in their body that a retroperitoneal approach makes sense, and I, and I have some uh, certain sympathy um, with that. And this is a publication from last year showing that this group from Japan uh, reported on 50 cases which they did um, in the sort of smaller child, uh, and they approached them all via a retroperitoneal uh, technique. Um, but they did report a 6% complication rate with um, kidneys having to be taken out and uh, um, compartment syndrome issues associated with that. One of the things we think about is the vascularity of the patient. And this is data which is hard to find, you know, how big an aorta is the right size aorta um, for these smaller children. A 10 kilo child has a body surface area of about uh, 0.5 meters squared. And um, a normal aorta um, is around 5 to 10 millimeters uh, diameter. And in our mind's eye, I think we would say, okay, five millimeters is an acceptable size aorta. Again, it depends on what sort of scanning that you're doing uh, to make that assessment. MR, in our experience, slightly underestimates the size you see when you're actually at surgery. Uh, but generally, I would say you could get away with a five millimeter aorta and perfuse the adult kidney adequately and not get steel syndrome in the lower limbs, although the Newcastle team, anyone from Newcastle? Okay, they did, uh, they put a case report out, I think it was last year, showing a child with a, a small um, aorta and they got steel syndrome in one of the legs and then had to have reconstructive surgery for that. The smaller child, of course, has a lower blood pressure 
unlike the adults, you know, many of these children do not have hypertension. And you need to be thinking carefully about the sort of kidney that you're bringing to that relatively low blood pressure. If you're taking a cadaveric organ in an obese patient who's had a history of hypertension, that kidney is used to and, in fact, needs a meaty blood pressure pushing the blood through it in order to get it to perfuse well. Selecting that organ for a small child who's maintaining a systolic pressure of around 80 or 90 may not end up with a good result. Is this something anybody sees in their practice? Abdominal compartment syndrome, where the pressures in the abdomen are significantly elevated such that it affects the perfusion of the kidney, but also the gut respiratory function, venous return, etc. cetera. I mean, we've seen it a couple of times, and I think the reasons that you get into it are not necessarily just the size of the kidney, the mass of kidney that you're putting in there, um, it also um, is relevant, what also is relevant is the duration of the surgery you're having with the loss of the uh, intracellular fluid into the extracellular compartments, the lumen of the gut, the wall of the gut, the amount of volume filling that you're giving them. You may then run into a problem when you start to close the abdomen because the gut and the tissues are edematous, plus this bulky kidney inside. Uh, we might do a delayed closure or use one of these um, collagen meshes, stratus mesh, to aid that process. Um, but we'd be very interested in your experience as well. With the live kidney, um, you know you're running into trouble when the anaesthetist says, uh, Francis, hang on, the airway pressures are going up when you're trying to close the abdomen. Um, and in addition, if you do an ultrasound scan, which we always do, post-transplantation. This is what you hope to see in the live kidney, a nice uh, uh, upstroke on the scan and then forward flow in systole and diastole. That tells you that the compartment pressure is low and the kidney is being perfused nicely. It's not so easy to interpret that in the cadaveric organ, which may have lost its diastolic um, forward flow anyway because of the complexity of retrieving the organ um, from the dying patient, plus if it's had a long cold time, um, then I think the, the diagnosis of compartment syndrome becomes more difficult than in the life. Not only the size in terms of kg is relevant, but the shape of the child. And I often hear myself saying this at the MDMs we attend, the child's 11 kilos, yeah, but what, what, are they a normal shape? Um, and you can be caught out. The child on the right-hand side has prune belly syndrome, a sort of mesenchymal defect. So it looks like they have a large abdomen, but no, actually, they have a small abdomen, and the guts effectively are like a sort of hernia lying outside the proper abdominal cavity. Um, and in addition, uh, they have poor musculature, and so their respiratory function after the surgery is going to be difficult. You need to think about these things in advance. And again, the child who's been in the wheelchair, I can remember distinctly a child um, who'd been assessed and thought suitable for go to, to go to transplantation, but no one had obviously taken the child out of the wheelchair and laid them on the bed. And that's because they can't lie flat on the bed. They've got significant contractures of their hips. And we had to chop down through the psoas muscles in order to straighten the patient out somewhat in order to access the um, aorta and the IVC. So beware of the funny-shaped child. Go for live donation. Yes, uh, Steve and I have no dispute. <laughs> the live transplant uh, will work better than the cadaveric transplant across all age groups. We in the UK agree about that, and the US uh, data also agrees. Um, with that, so go for live. Um, interrogating their data a little bit more uh, in detail, it's interesting if you have the cadaveric transplant, again, the smaller child, zero to one age group, distinguishes itself significantly from the other age groups in terms of um, graph survival. The smaller child is more difficult. 
especially if you're doing capillary donation. Ah, yes, the professor of surgery and I are still fighting some of our teenage instincts, believe it or not. You know what it's like, you can remember. Um, physiologically, you're changing. Psychologically, you're changing uh, when you're getting to this age. And this is a major concern for all of us um, because it translates into this. The first year, everybody's happy, the child's doing what they are, what you've asked them to do and coming to clinic, taking the meds. But after that time period and you settle down into a new way of life, they start to develop their own views uh, about what to do. And hence, their kidney function starts to deteriorate and the maximum time that they're likely to lose the transplant graft is in that teenage year, with one year follow-up. We know the risk factors quite well defined in terms of the, fam uh, the, the individual and the family set up. And in the UK, this is what it looks like. We all can recognize it easily enough. Actually doing something about it is really, really tough. And I think we rely hugely on the dialysis, uh, on the transplant nursing staff who often know these children much better than the medical staff. They've seen them through dialysis and now seeing them through transplantation and the closeness of that link and the relationship that's been built up is absolutely fundamental in maintaining their compliance and renal function afterwards. In terms of what disease has the child got, um, there are certain punishing diseases which not only kill off your own kidneys but are likely to come back and affect the transplant and then I think the decisions in terms of should we transplant or not, or not are much more difficult. So if you've got FSGS, the collapsing variety, um, you need to be thinking, mm, are we going to transplant them? Or if, that, if the transplant has failed due to recurrent disease, is it wise to go again for another transplant? Should we just wait for uh, on a period of hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis? If you're dealing with atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, somebody needs to have deep pockets, deep enough to get echolizumab out of the cupboard and give that to your child before or certainly after the surgery. In the UK, we have a sort of national program for managing these children now. I, I don't know about outside the UK, where, where echolizumab is sort of centrally funded. Anybody else have that sort of funding? Yes, is that? Where, where, where is that? Where are you from? Dublin. Dublin. Okay, so well done. Great. And is it easy to access it for you? For a typical HUS, yes. Okay. I don't. We have one transplant. All right, great. Um, as Maria alluded to, uh, I always consider the social side of things as well um, vitally important in maintaining that sort of family unit. Of course, the mother, all her time and energy and effort is devoted to looking after her chronically sick child, but, and she may well be the one who wants to donate in that family unit, and that can be quite destabilizing if she's the carer, the money winner person, sort of keeping the whole unit together, and now she's going to donate her kidney. So that takes a lot of planning. Ah, where is the professor? This is what we looked like <laughs> when we were growing up, and he still does at the weekend occasionally. Um, but we don't look like this anymore. And in fact, our children don't look like this anymore, do they? This is what 50% of children look like, and you're sitting comfortably in one of the capitals of uh, obesity in Europe, I'm afraid. Um, this is a major, major problem for us now, both in adults and in childhood, and we don't know really what to do with it. We know there's an intimate relationship between obesity and kidney failure. Some of the pathways, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, are sort of well understood, but there are other things going on here which we don't understand that well. We know it's happening. 
Well done the people at Cincinnati. They've tried to actually get a grip of this. And they found, um, as in the adults, that bringing your children into hospital, giving them a strict diet, psychotherapy, membership to the gym, chasing them around the, <laughs> the hospital gardens, actually doesn't work. It works for a short period of time. They lose a bit of weight, and then it comes back on. So they had a program of metabolic surgery in children, uh, not specifically in renal failure children, but in children uh, who were significantly overweight. And they found these amazing results, which is your diabetes goes away, your GFR improves, hypertension improves, and really impressively, the quality of life um, improves for the child significantly. I'll be very interested to hear what other people are doing to tackle this problem. How well is your dialysis going is something I like to think about because if your abdomen is rather a hostile area and you can't have PD, if you've had too many lines and you can't then get your adequate central venous access, you're in a very difficult position and probably you're not ever going to get to 10 kilos. So what do you do? You are push towards transplantation. And this is a publication um, came out last year from the New York group, which actually showed uh, that they, when they're pushed towards transplantation, they found that operating under 10 kilos is still okay in their hands. Uh, and this was a big group, over 200 cases that they were reporting on. Uh, that delay graft function, technical complications like thrombosis, ejection and outcome were actually equivalent in under 10 and over 10. Food for thought. So finally, if you are stuck on dialysis, we believe in fistula first. Thank you.